My name is William Baxter. Uh, I'm retired and what I do is mostly play with um, history and prehistory and walk people around and pontificate a lot. In this area, in this corner of New Mexico, we've got good evidence of people here for well more than 10,000 years. And as they're walking around here, they're living off the land, making use of the resources that are here. And that includes um, the obvious things like obsidian to make various tools with, and cherts, and uh, harder stones, ground stones, and such. The first real use of what would be called mining up here has to do with turquoise, the blue stone. And the really hard archaeological evidence of turquoise mining in this area, and it's related to ceramics, uh, comes from about 900 AD. So we've had people mining in these hills, certainly for the last 1,100 years, and probably several hundred years earlier than that, but we can say the last 1,100 years. Initially it was turquoise, and the degree to which turquoise was important in the southwest is, is widely documented. Uh, we do know that a lot of the early stuff came from here. Turquoise is famously not fingerprintable, so it's difficult to say that, for example, one of the pieces from Chaco Canyon came from this location. But it's likely that a goodly portion or a large portion of them did. Uh, then around 1325 or thereabouts, um, the local people developed a new thing that needed a mineral, and it was to do lead glaze decorated ceramics. They put lead glaze decoration on pottery. Uh, new technology here, extremely popular, and they began to make use of the galena or lead sulfide that was in the hills here and started mining it. And at the Bathsheba and some other locations, Pride of the Camp is a territorial galena mine that we'll be seeing. Um, so you had, in the early years, multiple hundreds of years ago, um, people up here for turquoise and for lead ore. Native Americans that were first here used the mineral resources that were available to them for tools and various other things. When they got into what we would actually call mining of turquoise and galena, um, they're doing it for ritual purposes, and for artistic purposes, although we don't really know what artistic meant to somebody that was living here 600 years ago. Uh, we call it that now. When the Spanish, the Europeans, show up, the approach to minerals is a little different, probably. Uh, the Spanish, of course, first came to El Norte looking for gold. And they initially didn't find it. Curiously, they did have samples of various kinds of metals that they showed to the Indians that were living here, and the Indians could differentiate, for example, brass from gold. The Indians here recognized gold. They recognized it as a useless, worthless metal, and they also recognized that the Europeans were fanatics for it, and since they wanted to get rid of the Europeans, they referred them to the next valley to go look for it there, because it was rich. Uh, the Europeans, however, finally settled in New Mexico for silver, silver and lead, the same thing that the Native Americans were using to decorate their pottery. The Spanish recognized had argentiferous galena, silver in the lead ore, and they knew how to separate out the silver. So we see the very first oldest European mines in New Mexico, and they are in the vicinity here, are for silver. Um, famously, when Coronado first showed up in 1540 and was looking around for gold and found none and left, the word got out that there was nothing of value in El Norte. For more than a lifetime, no one came back here. None of the Europeans returned. It was 40 years before the Europeans returned to the north. And when they did, it was a small expedition of a few soldiers and some priests, the Rodriguez Chamuscado Entrada, and two of the soldiers happened to be miners. And they got up here and they recognized some of the mineralizations in this part of New Mexico. 
and they recognized that it was likely that they would have um, silver mixed in with this lead ore. Uh, they took samples. The samples were high grade. They were the best from the load. And sure enough, they were very rich. The word got out that this was a cool place. And the most noticeable of these early miners was a man named Felipe Escalante. Uh, Escalante becomes important because he is here in 1581-82. And he goes back to Mexico City. And then in the colonizing expedition of Diego de Oñate in 1598, Escalante is a member of it. He's been here before. He's coming back now with Oñate. He's with the group. Oñate himself is from a silver mining family from Zacatecas. He knows silver, he knows the lead ore, he knows what's going on here, and he spends his time en route to El Norte, to New Mexico, with Felipe Escalante. And we have to believe that they were talking a lot about the silver mines that he was going to find when he got up here. Oñate and his people settle at San Juan, uh, near where Española is now, and Diego de Vargas and his colonists arrive at San Juan, a little bit north of here, and before the church is built, before the first acequia is dug, Escalante and Oñate are back here in the hills inspecting the things that we think Escalante was talking about on the entire trip up here. Escalante and Diego de Vargas are back here in the hills looking at the Galena mines that he knows are here, looking for silver, reporting silver back. Um, Oñate actually requests of the Viceroy in Mexico City that he send stamps, metal stamps, so that he can mark the silver he expects to produce in these hills. Um, Escalante himself was killed in the 1598-99 uh, events at Acoma, when there was the ambush that ultimately led to that story. Uh, Diego de Vargas, however, stays here. The very oldest documented mine in New Mexico dates from 1709, and it is what we now call the bottom dollar mine on the north side of the hills here. It was known as the Santa Rosa mine, and the documentation that we have of it is Governor Cubero signing this mine over, deeding it over, an existing mine, to General Uli Bari in 1709. So it's a transfer of a mining property, and it's a silver mine. It is the very oldest surviving documented mine that we have in New Mexico. Diego de Oñate, after talking to Escalante and seeing what was here, was so optimistic that he ordered from the Viceroy stamps to mark the silver ingots that he proposed to produce here and send back to the Viceroy. The silver ingots were specie, they were a measure of wealth, they were a way to uh, show that you had uh, profited the Spanish Empire. Uh, that they were never used and that the records never show any precious metal ever arriving in the Valley of Mexico from New Mexico is kind of beside the point. That's another whole story that was the people here as colonists, as long as they had no wealth and could produce nothing and functioned as a borderland defensive colony, were subsidized. The minute that they could show that they had wealth of their own, they knew they would lose their subsidy. So there was an incentive here to recognize that there was wealth, but not, not make it widely known. Certainly not send it back to the Viceroy. So the only records we have throughout um, Spanish colonial, Mexican, and territorial New Mexico of precious metals leaving New Mexico are metals going to Louisiana or to the United States. None of them go to Mexico. We have no records of any. The very oldest mines here are silver mines. They also produced lead. They needed lead for bullets for their harquebus firearms. Um, 
but certainly the silver was of interest and there's historical evidence of these mines being worked. There are five of them in the Cerrillos Hills. The very earliest ore processing operation by Vicente Zaldivar, who was Oñate's lieutenant, dates from 1600, the year 1600, and he used probably what was a single stamp mill, meaning a um, vertical crusher for the ore, and he used what we call the patio process, which is a platform made of stones and mixed with various chemicals, including copper sulfate and um, salt and water and ground into a fine powder. And by this means, along with mercury, quicksilver, they were able to extract the silver from Galena ore. We know it was going on here. We have no record of it ever being sent back to Mexico City, and in fact, no record of it ever going that way up until the territorial period. When the territorials show up here, the Spanish are already in a small way uh, working mines in the Cerrillos Hills and elsewhere. When the territorials show up, in colonial New Mexico, we had a kind of crypto mineral industry here. We don't know the nature of it because there are no records. The Pueblo Revolt uh, is responsible for the absence of some of the records, but even the post-revolt records don't say a whole lot about what was going on here. The clue that we have really comes from 1821, and 1821 marks the time when the Spanish Empire and the New World ended and the Republic of Mexico began. This was part of the Republic of Mexico. One of the differences was that the Republic of Mexico allowed American and Russian and French and British traders to come to the borderland colonies. And that's exactly what happened. And this stream of traders we now know as the Santa Fe Trail. They came in with a lot of goods. The first pack train that shows up in September of 1821 sells out. And what do they sell out for? Everybody in Santa Fe is scrambling to find something that will make the, um, um, the Americano traders happy and that they can carry back to Missouri with them in return for gingham and for sewing needles and thread and for hatchets and the manufactured items that they're bringing with them. What they're doing is digging up their little caches of coins, of pesos, of silver pesos and other things, small gold ingots even if they had them, uh, anything that they could trade for. And the thing that really reveals the nature of the economy of New Mexico was the second pack train to come down the Santa Fe Trail, the McKnight James train, that shows up uh, actually six weeks after the first one. And he shows up and there's nothing left in New Mexico that the Americanos will take in return for their manufactured goods. The second pack train is left high and dry. They, act, they ultimately end up consigning the entire train to a Santa Fe merchant in the hopes that by the following spring something could be scrabbed together to allow them to get payment for their, their goods. There was so little in New Mexico. It was not a money economy. There was very little in the way of this metal, which kind of indicates that the silver mining that was going on here was pretty small scale. And what was produced was probably smuggled back to Mexico City. There are no records of it. We see this going on for a very long period of time. In 1846, the territorials show up. This becomes a territory of the United States. Things continue in a normal manner, but with an, an overlay of Anglo um, politicians and land speculators and lawyers and other reputable people. Uh, the big event that happened in the Cerrillos Hills happened in 1870 when the Territorial Land Court um, found invalid the Delgado y Pino claim to a land grant in the Cerrillos Hills. They, they decided that their claim, which in fact was probably a fraudulent one, uh, 
was not valid and that this land that we now call the Cerritos Hills was opened to public use. You could move in and farm, mine, whatever it was up here. The Delgado family, however, was a very powerful New Mexico family. Um, five brothers lived here. They had a ranch on the north side of the hills here. And anyone that happened to come onto the land, the brothers would run them off. And even though this land theoretically was open to homesteading, uh, nobody could successfully do it. The most powerful territorial politician of the time was Stephen Elkins. Uh, Stephen Elkins, who developed the, the Ortiz Mountains, uh, Cerritos Township, and a lot of this land around here, also wanted to develop the Cerritos Hills. And he recognized the roadblock of the Delgado brothers. So he hired a couple of Colorado miners, Frank Dimmick and Robert Hart, in 1877, and had them go back to Colorado and recruit miners to come down here to the Cerritos Hills to develop what Elkins regarded as his property. Two Colorado miners succeeded in spades. They went to a town called Leadville, which was in the midst of labor strife. A lot of the miners there were blackballed. And Demick and Hart in Leadville say, hey guys, come down to New Mexico the land is for the taking, there's silver in the hills, you know what this is like. And starting with January of 1879, this place was flooded with Anglo miners. By June of that year, there were more than a thousand of them here in the Cerritos Hills. They entered into a feeding frenzy. Everybody digging a hole in the hills, every square inch of the hills claimed they even went so far as to organize their own mining district, and because there were so many of them, they all agreed that the claims would be half size. So this Cerritos Mining Boom mining claim is de detectable on modern maps because it's only 300 feet wide, where normal claims are 600 feet wide. We had every square inch of the hill covered. The Delgado brothers had no chance. There were just too many of these Anglo miners. And all of the Anglo miners, Anglo is not a fair term because a lot of them came from Italy or Spain or Germany or Poland. Uh, we even had some Chinese, we had some blacks up here. It was a real hodgepodge of miners. Um, but there were so many of them. They all are digging holes. And we get into, this is the fun part of it, the nature of miners. Um, you can imagine if you have a hole in the ground and there are people all around you with their holes and one of your neighbors comes over and says, uh, say Joe, how's your mine? If you in fact have something good in the hole and you're starting to get something you think might be valuable and he's asking you what's there, you're going to tell him it's bad, it's nothing, I'm not seeing anything. Contrary wise, if he shows up and says, hey Joe, what's there? And you have nothing, it's a dry hole, you're probably gonna say the opposite again. You're gonna lie to him and say something like, it's really looking promising, I think I've got a great thing here, hoping that he might buy a share of your mine. So there was an, an incentive, and there always has been, for miners to lie. Mark Twain's famous quote is, uh, a mine in the West is a hole in the ground owned by a liar. And that's traditional. Of course, the miners themselves knew that when they asked him, they asked Joe what his mine was like, uh, they were, Joe would answer with the opposite of the truth. So you begin to get into reverse psychology, and it's, it's a real challenge. In any case, um, something between 1,000 and 1,500 miners in 1879 and 1880 in the Cerritos Hills, all of them digging holes, ultimately about 5,000 holes in the hills from that period, about 1,000 of which were pretty significant holes, and um, maybe 200 of which are really hazardous, deep, deep holes, are still here. And it is because of that hazard that this place needed some attention before it could be opened to the public for visitation. 
Because these holes are here, it's a very interesting place. It contains the history of New Mexico. It's in a small area, uh, the footprint of everybody that was ever here, leaving their mark, and it's that that makes it such a fascinating place. The Cerritos Hills are the remnants of a volcano. The volcano here came in two episodes. Uh, we know from the geology uh, 34 million years ago roughly and another episode about 30 million years ago, but this is part of a larger geology that takes place in this corner of New Mexico that uh, we know is a tertiary intrusive event. And all of the mountains between Edgewood and La Cienega are part of the Ortiz Porphyry Belt, the Cerritos Hills among them. So on the order of 30 million years ago, there was a very large mountain here that was a volcano did not have a lot of lava associated with it, so the modern equivalent is probably something like Mount St. Helens. A lot of pyroclastic material, soft material, a lot of action. That mountain is gone. In the last 30 million years, it's eroded away. There's nothing left of it. There are a few stub ends of the interior piping of the mountain, the porphyry intrusive material, the magma from the center of the earth that is hardened, and those are what we see now as the Cerritos Hills. The porphyry material, the magma itself, makes a very fine-grained granitic rock, and the Indians and others use it because of its hardness. So, um, particularly in turquoise, which I'll talk about in a moment, the porphyry material is hard enough that if you take a chunk of porphyry rock and you hit another rock with it, the other rock will break being softer. This is very important when you're going after turquoise because the matrix, the native rock in which we find turquoise, tends to be softer than porphyry and a lot of the tools up here are made from this granitic porphyry rock. Some of them very beautiful tools, a lot of them. Multiple thousands of tools up here, uh, not all of which are visible on the surface anymore. The volcano that was here, again, is here no longer. It's gone. It's eroded away. Uh, the mineralizations that are related to that process are what make the Cerritos Hills so interesting, so, at, so attractive to miners. The galena, the lead ore, is part of that. We also have iron ore up here. Uh, iron was a precious metal until the railroad arrived in 1880, so we have a number of iron mines up here. Uh, when the railroad got here, then manganese became important here because they wanted to make steel, and that was one of the ingredients for steel. So we have a really wide variety of mines here. The interesting stuff for most people would be the turquoise mines. Turquoise needs a particular environment in order to form, and it's a very late mineral geologically. It didn't come with the volcano. It didn't come when the volcano eroded away. The turquoise that's in the Cerritos Hills is from the last 100,000 years or even less. And we're just now learning more and more about turquoise, so this may change. But it's a very late, a very fragile mineral. It's deposited hydrothermally. What you get is water heated by the residual volcanism uh, rotating through the crustal material of the earth. Uh, in this area we have a lot of sulfides and the sulfides break down uh, providing the materials so that the groundwater tends to be a little acidic. It has sulfuric acid, a weak sulfuric acid in it. This sulfuric acid water leaches the components of the rocks, it becomes highly mineralized, and then as it circulates through and cools at different levels, it precipitates out the interesting stuff. One of the interesting things will be hydrous aluminum phosphate, and that is turquoise. And it deposits generally in cracks or vacuoles within the native rock and near the surface. So turquoise tends not to be found deep. 
It tends not to be found in the wet regions of the world. It has to be very dry and near the surface. When turquoise is exposed to the air, it de deteriorates very quickly. So on the order of a few tens of years, a piece of turquoise exposed to wind, rain, sun, etc. will argillize. It becomes salacious. In the Surreal's Hills, one of the salvations of this place is the same thing that makes it so interesting, and that is that uh, we have a lot of isolated mineralizations. So you'll find here uh, turquoise, and then a hundred yards away galena, and then a hundred yards away iron, and then a hundred yards away something else. We even have a small amethyst deposit here. Uh, it's the variety of materials here that has made it so attractive. And it's also the variety of materials here that has been its salvation. Because we don't have a large concentrated deposit of one kind of material, there, there's been no drive to do an industrial operation here. There's no Cerrios open pit mine because there's not enough of one thing here to make that economical. And around here we've had numerous smelters and processing plants. They've all failed because when they develop their process for one load of ore, the next load of ore is so different they've got to start from scratch. And it's been, again, the reason we have so much up here, and it's still here. So unlike most places in the West where things of this sort have happened, uh, here you can come and still see a prehistoric Native American mine that looks prehistoric. It hasn't changed much. You can come here and see a Spanish mine, and Spanish mines look different from territorial mines. So you're seeing in the Cerrillos Hills a wide variety of different mineralizations, and it's that that has made it interesting. When the Indians in the early 1300s developed the lead glaze decorated technology and began to use the lead from the loads in the Surreal Hills here quite close. They, the, the technology spread. By the 1400s, virtually all of the Pueblos in this area were making the same lead glaze decorated ceramics. Some of them quite far away from here, but all of them. The curious thing that we now know is that preferentially many of the, the Indian potters came here for their lead ore. And not only here, they came here to the lead deposit that is near to the major turquoise deposit. Even though they may have had lead available to them at their home Pueblo, they seem to have come here for much of the lead. And we're asking ourselves, why might that be so? The guess of the moment is because the lead here is immediately adjacent to turquoise, and turquoise gave it an aura of sacredness. It made the lead better, we think. And this might be a reason why someone would travel 50 miles each way to carry a load of lead back to their home Pueblo. When the territorial miners began to show up in 1879, all of them came here with the expectation of finding gold. They had come from Colorado in a place that started out as a gold mine and secondarily became a lead and silver mine. Uh, they came here with that same mindset and every one of the 5,000 holes that were dug here was almost certainly started in quest of gold. We still have people poking around here for gold because eight miles south of us is a pretty significant gold source in New Mexico from the same geology. But in fact, uh, nobody up here has ever found gold. There has been no hole that we're aware of that paid for the cost of digging the hole by any gold that might have come out of it. The gold that is produced here is in very small amounts and it's always ancillary to something else. You might uh, be doing a silver mine and happen to get a small amount of gold out of it, but the Cerrillos Hills is not gold. Cerrillos Hills is silver and lead. In 1998, Santa Fe County 
floated a bond issue to acquire open space. The voters of Santa Fe County overwhelmingly approved this for $12 million to acquire property in Santa Fe County for public use and preservation. One of the very first projects was in the Cerritos Hills. A local citizen group got together, the Cerritos Hills Park Coalition, and promoted this as a Santa Fe County open space. The land here had been platted for multiple large houses up here, and it was quite obvious that this was going to housing rather than any historical use or preservation. But when the bond issue came through, the options changed. And very quickly, many of the owners here, quite agreeably, joined in with this and Santa Fe County acquired 1116 acres of the Cerritos Hills as Santa Fe County open space. The land that was acquired had numerous, as it turned out, I believe 86 um, vertical shafts that were so hazardous that we could not invite the public in here with them. For this and for the necessary archaeological survey, we depended upon the state of New Mexico, the Mining and Mineral Division, and the Abandoned Mine Land Bureau. And over a three-year period, we performed a very extensive informational archaeological survey of the area, identified the mines, preserved a number of them, nearly two dozen of them, and protected the rest of them so that now we have a place that's safe to visit. This park was opened on May 24th in 2003 and since then it has become one of the regular features for visitation in northern New Mexico. We also run tours here, uh, historical tours, botanical tours, and even some geologists up here. You can also do it on horseback and enjoy the hills or on mountain bike, no motorized vehicles. But mostly what we have up here are hikers and people come up here all the time, every day. Being a Santa Fe County open space, there are no fees. Uh, at this time, we are seeing something on the order of 20,000 visitors a year to this park, we reckon. Because we don't charge fees, we don't have a really accurate count. Prior to this time, there was incidental visitation, and it might have been 50 or 100 people a year up here. So now we're getting some pretty heavy use. We've got a system of stewards, trail monitors. We maintain the trails. We try to keep people on the trails. Our featured mines come with interpretive signs. The biggest, most interesting mine is the Pride of the Camp Claim, which dates from 1879. It was, we know, significant because most of the surrounding mines are identified by their location relative to the pride of the camp. So it's one of the biggest of the mines. It was clearly a Galena mine, although in the catalog of the mines that, was, that were up here that was produced in 1880, it was identified as a manganese mine, probably not that. Uh, immediately near to it, we have other featured mines developed by AML, and they include the Rosalia mine, another Galena mine, the Canton and the Josh, more Galena mines on that same location. Uh, Galena was a major territorial uh, mineral up here. It was something that they went for often. Of all of the 1,000 to 2,000 miners that showed up here from 1879 to 1884. The most interesting one, perhaps, was Major D.C. Hyde. Know very little about him. He's probably from New York State, probably from Rochester, although he might be from New York City. And he came here with a great deal of money, where the miners that were up here were buying and selling, lying through their teeth and selling, shares in their mines for a hundred or two hundred dollars. In 1880 that was a lot of money. D.C. Hyde came in here with the knowledge that he believed no one else had. He had it in his head that turquoise was associated with gold. 
and that when you found turquoise, you were sure to find gold. All of the other miners up here regarded turquoise as worthless. So the turquoise mines were pretty much ignored. Hyde came in here and he bought them all. And he, in some cases, paid as much as $2,500 for a claim. These are $1,880. Big bucks. He acquires these. He hires a great number of people. He notably acquired Mount Chalchowetl, the great prehistoric turquoise mine in the Surios Hills, and hired people to blast and dig tunnels all through it, excavating rooms from the middle of it. It's basically a hollow mountain now. He's modified some of the Native American turquoise diggings on that mountain. Uh, he has many tunnels all the way through it. It is quite obvious to us today that gold is not associated with turquoise, and it obviously became evident to D.C. Hyde that he was wrong, and that this great investment he had made uh, was for nothing. In March of 1880, the railroad arrived, and D.C. Hyde apparently tried to recoup some of his investment by attracting tourists to Mount Chalchowetl and other places. And he presented his wonder rooms. He represented them as a civilization no one understood or knew about that had hollowed out a mountain in the southwest and you had to see it to believe it. He would run tours from the railroad station up to his hill and charge them 25 cents to see the wonder rooms. This didn't last long. It was not uh, very rem remunerative. D.C. Hyde disappears almost exactly 12 months after he arrives here. In the late summer of 1880, instantly he's not here anymore. We can't find him. I can find nothing of him in the records. Nobody knows what happened to him. One of the guesses is that his wife killed him when she found out what he'd done with the family fortune. But for whatever reason, D.C. Hyde is no longer around. The reason that I'm here and the reason that this is so important is not because I like mines. It is because I like history and I think people should know where they come from, why they're here, why are we here, what went before. And for most of what humans do, there's no evidence of it. But in the Cerrillos Hills, we have everything here. We have everything on, you can see it. You can see something from a thousand years ago. It's still here. And there are very few places in the world like this. This is magical. This place, the Surreal's Hills, is the result of the cooperative efforts of a number of people, a large citizens group, uh, a number of people in Santa Fe County. But there is clearly more than anything else the Abandoned Mine Land Bureau of the state of New Mexico is the reason that we're here today. This place would not exist without them. Uh, it was the impetus of one of their members, Homer Milford, who now retired, uh, who really got us going on this and has fed us material all along the way. And it's the AML that has made this into a park. If it were not for them, we wouldn't be here.